Now, when it comes to women specifically, I think there's a little more that needs to be done. Um, I think regulators in general need to start looking a little bit more about um, uh, gender intelligent design, both in the policies that they make, as well as in the products that they produce. Um, hello and welcome to the Anahita speaker series presented by Carnegie India, celebrating stirring stories of empowerment, struggle and success from women professionals in different fields across the globe. Stories we hope are bound to inspire young professionals. I'm Adarsh Anjan, working as a research assistant at Carnegie India. Today, we are honored to have with us Sharmishta Apaya. Sharmishta Apaya has over 15 years of experience in data, finance and development. She is a senior digital development specialist at the World Bank Group where she's leading a new digital data uh, infrastructure business line, exploring the power of digital public infrastructure uh, and data-driven innovation. With a focus on FinTech, innovative business models and regulations, she studies digital finance and its transformative potential and financial inclusion. Shamishta, welcome to the show. Thank you, Radish. It's good to be here. So, You've had a very interesting journey, completing a bachelor's degree in industrial biotechnology and then going on to do your master's in neuroscience. From there, you went to work as an investigative researcher for the BBC and then transitioned to the public development sector with a focus on fintech and financial inclusion. Tell us uh, about your journey through the various sectors you've worked in. Sure. Um, so I think neuroscience will, was and is will always be sort of my first love. When I when I was growing up, I think science was something that just came really easy to me. Um, it is in sort of international development or politics or areas I work in now, but science came easy to me. So it was a, a natural thing for me to go into engineering and neuroscience. And um, a lot of things that I've learned there, the lateral thinking, the analysis are things that I can use uh, today. What I feel like is mainly useful in your 20s is that you try and do lots of different things, right? So you do. So I did, like, as I said, neuroscience. I worked as a researcher for a while. I did, um, I did consulting at one of the big four. I worked as an ethics, um, at an ethics body. Um, and while I knew that I liked science, I think I realized that what I didn't want to do was be work in the lab all day. I've spent many a nights actually working and waiting for my gels to run. But what I really missed was projects and I missed deadlines. I missed working with people. So I used my 20s to sort of experiment and try lots of different things um, and try and see what it was that I liked and what made me tick. And then I found myself working at the Bank of England. And why I liked that was one, um, being in finance was a big challenge for me because that was not something I'd ever done. So I what you know, it inculcated in me sort of this this desire to learn and desire to understand how markets move, what how decisions are made. Um, and so that was what I realized I wanted to work in and what I wanted to focus on. And there's also something about working in policy, policy about making really big and um, impactful step changes that can affect, affect millions of lives. And I think that's what sort of got me. And that's, you know, in my 20s and doing all of that, um, Background work is what I realized is the areas I wanted to focus in. And then after working in the UK for quite a while, I think I worked there for about 14 years, I found myself sort of at the Bank of England, which was one of the, it's been a really exciting and interesting playground because it helps you work on international development and development was always sort of where my heart was. Um, so it's sort of a modeled history, but it's kind of led me to where I am today. I want to just uh, turn back the clock a little bit more and talk about your formative years. Uh, how, did, how did your childhood or any other early influences in your life shape who you are today and the work that you do? 
So one of my biggest influences, I'd have to say, is my father. My father's a psychiatrist, so that probably explains why I did neuroscience and why science came quite easily to me. Um, so conversations at the dinner table were always about things like empathy, identity, and we talk a lot about books and quite specifically people like Oliver Sacks um, and V.S. Ramachandran, who all who talk, who are both neuroscientists. And they talk about their case histories with um, people with neurological disorders. And a lot of it is about how minute changes um, either within the brain or from external environments can actually change how the brain works, the neuroplasticity of the brain. How the brain is such a powerful organism that it can adapt to changes. So this is what sort of caused my, you know, really big love in neuroscience and, and wanting to understand a bit more about perspectives and how it works. But it, what, what it also inculcated in me was a, um, was, was a need to understand identity um, and, and human behavior. So it is kind of like what makes us human and how do humans behave in a certain way. And I think that is sort of potentially the one theme that actually works through where I work and, and how the neuroscience has also helped uh, in what I do now. So what is really interests me is people um, and how people function, how they work and 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 also, um, as I mentioned before, the love of learning. So, you know, even those like my father and the conversations we had, what it really what it really instilled was um, a, a persevering love of learning and constantly learning about new things and being challenged by new things. Um, you said that uh, through science, you explored concepts like empathy uh, in the beginning of your life. How do you think you've been able to apply uh, that same concept? But from a dis different perspective from a in a development sector so um this um, you might have heard of something called behavioral economics so this is like twinning together the the concepts of things like neuroscience and how we we see the view world and view the world together with um how economics functions right so we can't see anything as a individual vertical anymore they're all sort of horizontal and all of these they're all multidisciplinary um, so, so for me, empathy was, was all about understanding human condition and trying to help them change the way they work. So before when I was doing neuroscience, a lot of it was I worked with bipolar disorder and schizophrenia patients. And I worked quite specifically on trying to understand why they heard voices in their head. So while a lot of it was research, I mean, a majority of it was actually meeting patients, understanding them, talking to them, wanting to actually create the change that we could potentially create in their lives, right, through research. Um, and that's that empathy is kind of what actually brought me into international development as well. So today I work much more in areas such as financial inclusion, bringing people into the formal economy, um, getting people digital identity, but all of it comes with an underlay of, of empathy. Like, why do you want people to have all of the things that other people have? Why do we want to democratize data? Why do we want to democratize financial services? Um, it, it's about it's about bringing them into that, but using elements of things like behavioral economics but understanding biases that we have. Um, so, you know, simple examples, like one of the things that we've we've always thought about is can we give cell phones to everybody and, and will that help instead of us spending so much money and time on things like international you know development and capacity building but we found that that doesn't usually work and and you know sometimes that empathy is also about putting yourself in someone else's position and trying to understand their worldview so um so it is a constant learning process and it's definitely helped me there and but it is it is what keeps me going sort of every day and in, in the job that i do now uh, yeah. uh, artificial intelligence and um, synthetic bi biology and other emerging technology fields are making great strides in also making, uh, you know, improving the human condition. Do you uh, see yourself going back uh, to the sciences possibly any anytime in the future? Um, unfortunately, they, I mean, with things like science, you have to keep up to date with all the research. So I wouldn't go back to pure research and pure science because there's a reason why I left that. 
But, um, and especially coming back to the role that I'm doing now as well, what it is is, mu is much more cross-cutting. So where I find myself working is in things like using AI to help things like um, drone drops of vaccines, um, using it to help uh, insurance products, develop better formed insurance products. So using that data and analysis to actually create um, to create better products with the use of things like AI and machine learning. We also use AI a lot more now in regulation. Um, and so that's something I've been working on quite heavily. How do we actually use the data that we get from the market and using things like emerging technologies like AI to, to form analysis and to form ideas. And that actually goes into policy making. Um, so there's, there's a huge interlink. I think right now uh, I'm looking a little bit more at the core and the raw data, but what it, what it is that exists, and then the applications in different fields. So not just in the sciences, but also in areas like agriculture, government to person payments, um, and a number of other areas. I want to talk to you a little bit more about financial inclusion, because that's a space where you've uh, worked for a long time. Uh, financial inclusion is a critical aspect of uh, socioeconomic development. From your perspective, what are some of the most significant barriers to achieving greater financial inclusion for women? And what role can fintech play in overcoming these challenges? Thanks. Um, so maybe let me start with describing how we look at financial inclusion. I think a lot of people like there's a very different definition of financial inclusion world over. But the way we sort of at the World Bank look at it is we look at um, access, so access to services use of those services, so not just having a bank account, but how those bank accounts are used. Um, and then the quality of services that's offered. Do you, do, does everyone have the right kind of products? Do they have the right kinds of insurance, the right kinds of lending products? Um, so that it's the whole suite that actually makes up financial inclusion. Um, we only currently have sort of one of the biggest indicators that we look at is um, something called Findex. Um, and the Findex data, which is done sort of every maybe three to four years, the last uh, data set says there are about 1.4 billion people around the world that are still financially excluded. Now, this is a, still a big change from, say, in the last decade, um, where it's, you know, at least uh, over a billion people have become what is classified now as included. Um, and there's been a big step change, mostly because of mobile payments. Now, when it comes to women specifically, most of those 1.4 billion, about a billion of them are women. So women are still quite disproportionately affected um, by not having access to the formal economy. Now, fintech has been great in, and especially in things like mobile payments and e-wallets. M-Pesa, which started off in, in 2007, is one of the biggest game changers that I think we've seen across the world. And we're still looking for the next silver bullet. And I don't think anything, at least so far, has had as much of an impact as actually using your mobile phone as a wallet. Um, what it basically did was it disintermediated the entire financial sector. It removed the need for banks. It removed the need for bank branches. Um, it created this entire new distribution model. The use of agent networks, um, the use of being able to use your corner shop is pretty much your bank. All of this was sort of newer concepts or older concepts that were packaged in a new way. And so that has really created massive changes in the world of financial inclusion. Now, when it comes to women specifically, I think there's a little more that needs to be done. Um, I think regulators in general need to start looking a little bit more about um, uh, gender intelligent design, both in the policies that they make, as well as in the products that they produce. So, for example, um, insurance for women and and uh, or lending products for women might need to look and feel differently than they are for everyone as a whole. So when regulators actually use, and this is in terms of products, but even in terms of policies. So for example, tiered um, KYC, which is tiered know your customer, affects women much more positively than it, and then it has sort of the population as a whole is what we've seen in some of the studies we've uh, looked at. 
So regulators also need to start looking at things like sex uh, disaggregated data. So actually looking at the data, understanding what the changes have been, and then inputting that into um, into their policy making. And so this is an area that we're doing. We're beginning to do quite a bit more work on to actually say, okay, what are the changes that you want you want and can make? Because I think there's always um, there is there is incentive on the role of the regulators to actually do this, but to but causing that change and actually making that change a reality or understanding what needs to be done is a little bit more difficult. Just building off of that, um, in your experience, what has been the impact uh, that you have seen of fintech in helping, first of all, build financial inclusion and then uh, increase financial inclusion, especially for women? And on that same related question, do you think that fintech solutions are enough or there are core governance challenges uh, that need that can be supplemented by uh, fintech products, but not entirely supplanted by it. So I definitely think fintech products can't exist in sort of isolation without a more supportive government framework. Um, there needs to be, uh, and I've said this before, but fintech being a sort of catalyst. It is something as a facilitator that helps you get to sort of the end solution. But government, uh, either both hard and soft infrastructure needs to exist. So the hard infrastructure being things like broadband access, access to clouds. The soft, softer infrastructure is the governance, the policies, the data protection, cybersecurity, all of this all needs to exist in tandem for fintech to actually work. I definitely think there's fintech and digital financial services as a whole has created a massive step change. I mean, we're seeing things now like, and I think the COVID actually was a big example of how this could help. So a number of social payments, um, because people couldn't go out and get them, and COVID related payments were all done through digital channels. So that was a really big change of how fintech created a step change and actually people recognized a lot more the benefit of um, fintech. Of course, there's, there's the other side of it, which we shouldn't ignore, which is that sometimes when people go stand in queue to want to, um, to go and get their salary, um, in cash, it's because it is also a social interaction, right? So we can't look at all of this in isolation. We need to look at it both in sort of the government and the policy context, but also in the societal context as well. How does that affect, um, fintech and how we do? So, and, Every, every country has slightly different contexts. So, for example, M-Pesa and mobile wallets worked really, really well in Kenya, but didn't work so well in India. So we also need to understand that and change the way that it functions and what we're actually releasing into markets, depending on market context um, to more generally. I want to talk a little bit about the space that you've worked in. The fintech sector has a deeply... Uh, uh, like a great gender imbalance as well. Um, when it comes to the sector itself and the people working in it, have you seen a uh, change in the last 15 years that you've worked there? And what do you think are the steps that need to be taken to bridge this gender gap in the future? I'm going to clarify what you mean by that. Do you mean ge the gender gap of people working within the sector yes. as opposed to the sector helping, right? So you're right. There is a big gender gap, right? So in this, there's always been a gender gap in finance and there's been a gender gap in tech. Um, there's been, you know, there's, there's a lot that's been done to support women and to support women entrepreneurs, um, and to give them funding. Uh, but we still see massive discrepancies in both people, um, working in the sector as well as, um, as well as those, those they support. Um, very often, I mean, I, I would quite often find myself in a room that where I was the only woman or quite often the only woman of color. Um, I think things are changing. There's been big efforts made to actually change that. This comes with pros and cons. Um, I, I think what it needs to do is it has to start at a much lower level. It needs to start at the level of um, schooling, at university, um, at, at how we're taught, about how we're taught to think. So it needs to start differently, but they're definitely in the last sort of 10 to 15 years, 
has been a change in in the in the number of people uh, working in in fintech, working in finance. And it's very interesting that this also is quite country specific. So if I take the example of Seychelles, when I work at the Seychelles Central Bank, most of the people in the room are women. Uh, when I work in um, in some in the Maldives, lots of people are women. Um, so working in finance and working in tech. So it is also quite um, country specific. I think there's a is you know there's a lot being done with forums. There's a lot of women supporting each other. Um, but I think there's more that can be done. This there is more diversity now in in boards. I think in some cases, like the UK um, and the EU, they're being they're being asked. There's a certain quota. Um, quota systems can be bad and or good. Like there's there's a there's a balance there that we need to attain. Um, but basically, I guess the the end result is there's definitely a benefit in having more women on boards. But there is a long way to go for us to um, for us to get to sort of the balance. You've had a brilliant uh, career when it comes to work, but I also want to focus a little bit on your personal life. Um, what's the most adventurous uh, thing you've done in your personal life that gave you a confidence <laughs> boost for your career? Um, let's see. Um, so I guess maybe one of the... Um, so I I love new experiences. I'm always sort of trying new things and, and both in my personal and um, my work life. And I have to admit, and I think this is something that's that's quite important for me to say, is that work maybe makes up about 40% of my life. And I think I spend a lot of time, you know, focusing on my hobbies or focusing on what I like to do. And I think that's that's important for people for people to know as well, right? And to people to recognize that, that work isn't sort of everything. So one of the things I did, and this was, this was probably in my early 30s, was that um, I took a year off work to go traveling, to go backpacking. Now, in in the Western world, this is relatively common. People take a gap year after they finish um, university and then go off traveling for a while. But for um, a brown girl from South India, this was not very common. And also, I was much older when I did it. So lots of people do it in their early 20s. And so it was quite um, scary to do it uh, in my 30s. Now, the reason I did it was also a little bit of um, soul searching. It was sort of like, was I really doing the career that I should be doing? Was I in the place that I should be? Um, so it was it was more about trying to find what it is that maybe was missing or trying to have new experiences. So I took, so I basically bought myself a one-way ticket put on a backpack and then left London where I was living at the time. Um, and I have to say, it's been the most exciting and exhilarating experiences I've ever had. I don't think I would have the guts to do it again, but um, some, there's something quite beneficial in going into the unknown, um, you know, where you don't know the dangers ahead, but it was amazing. And I said yes to most experiences that were offered. So I lived on uh, a gaucho farm for a while, which is where they breed horses. I, um, I went horseback riding in the snow. I worked in an Indian restaurant. I went diving. So I had all these amazing experiences, none of which I would ever trade. But I think what was more important at the end of sort of this one year of, of um, traveling was that I realized that there wasn't that much to be found, that I was kind of doing exactly what I should have been, you know, what I should be doing. Um, so that in itself was quite a, um, it was a very useful, useful process in, in that sense. Um, and I have to say that in that time, so I was still at the Bank of England and I did try to quit my job uh, before I went traveling. But I have to um, say that my supervisors there were, were very uh, supportive and instead of letting me quit, sort of let me take a year off and then come back to the job. And then very interestingly offered me a promotion pretty soon after I came back. So um you know, sometimes it's good to sort of just go with the flow and go with instead of forcing something to happen, you should go with your instincts. And uh, that's definitely something that I've sort of used throughout my career is to sort of go with my instincts a little bit. Um, it's not always easy, but but uh, to trust, you know, to trust yourself, but it's definitely something that has served me well. Yes, spontaneity can definitely lead to new experiences and, you know, unexpected opportunities. Has there been a, a moment where pursuing a hobby or a passion outside of work suddenly 
unexpectedly led to uh, a, an opportunity for you? Um, so like I said, I quite like new experiences. So even, you know, in the cities that I live in, I'm always trying new things. So one of the things we used to do in London was something called a secret supper club. So this is where you bought a ticket and you wouldn't know what food you were eating or where this this um, supper club was meant to be. And you got told a couple of days before uh, what the menu was, the location of the place. So and you ended up, you know, it used to be hit or miss as these things go. But you would ended up ended up with um, maybe a group of about 20 people. Uh, completely random, but usually very interesting because they were all sort of interested in similar things um, in in a random location. So I went to one of these, I think it was called White Supper Club, um, if I get the name right, but um, and, and was sitting at the dinner table and um, the man to my right and I started talking and he started telling me about what he was doing um, and he was starting a new accelerator for fintech um, in London. And this was before fintech was even a term or even a word. So this was in maybe 2011, 2010, where no, the fin term fintech wasn't that common. Yes, we'd heard about the tech bubble and we'd heard about Silicon Valley, but fintech wasn't so much of a thing. So I was, you know, naturally curious and we started talking. Um, and he, he started explaining what he was doing. And at the end of the conversation, he asked me to be a mentor for some of the firms that were actually beginning to enter the incubator. Um, and I definitely say that that was sort of, for me, the starting point of actually getting into fintech and getting interested in it and has actually sort of changed the direction of, you know, where I was going and, and sort of put me on the path that I am now. Going back to your work a little bit, uh, you've recently started a new role as a senior digital development specialist at the World Bank. Can you tell us a little bit more about what the role entails and what the focus so, of your work will be? So, so um, with fintech, what, you know, like I said, it's mainly the catalyst. It's mainly the, you know, the facilitator. What I'm doing now is much more working on the foundational elements. So what are the infrastructures that sit under it that allow things like fintech or government e-services or, you know, drones to deliver vaccines to work? So it's working on things like the hard infrastructure and the soft in infrastructure, as well as looking at data as the social good. So we're looking at, at data as a whole and data ecosystems. And what we're trying to do is build a new business line that will be cross-cutting, that will work across health, it will work across agriculture, it will work across social protection, but it basically creates the foundation for which everything works. So. I guess the way I describe it is always it's the rails and roads on which the other systems might work. Um, and, you know, being from India also, you must have um, heard about DPI, which is the digital public infrastructure. And we're doing quite a bit of work on that as the foundational elements for creating uh, public good. That's all right. Yeah, that's a great note to end it on. And uh, so let me uh, just ask you the last question. What is a book you would like to recommend to our audience? Oh, um, <laughs> so I'm quite an avid of um, sort of an es escapism from the real world more than, more than um, you know, to contribute to, to what I'm working on. So most often I will only be reading um, nonfiction, I mean, fiction, not nonfiction. So maybe if I only had one to pick from, um, I'd say Illusions by Chitra Banerjee. Um, what the book is, it's a retelling of the Mahabharata, which a lot of us know and love, uh, but it's from the view about her feelings, her dreams, uh, Draupadi. So it, she it talks about views the battle, how she views having five husbands, you know, whether she, whether she had a choice in any of this, but no one ever delved into it. So I think that's, um, it's it's very interesting and it gives you new fresh insight and a new perspective in looking at it. And maybe I will end, I might get it wrong, is that um, she says, I am expansive and I am uncontainable, but I always was. It's just that I never knew it. And I think this is something that all of us need, and, and women especially, and young young people also need to think about um, with, with one of the lines um, in the book. And it's full of sort of, you know, really interesting and meaningful lines. That is a brilliant note to end on, and it sounds sounds like a fascinating book. Uh, Sharmishta, thank you so much for taking out uh, time today to have this conversation. 
Uh, to our audience, we hope you enjoyed the conversation as, as, as much as we did. Do visit Carnegie India's YouTube channel to access all the episodes of the Anaita Speaker Series. Thank you and see you next month.